Hi guys, today we're gonna upgrade the acquisition data acquisition system on an old Bosch dyno. So this is a great piece of kit. You see it's an eddy current dyno with two rollers here. Uh, the not so great thing about this kit is that its data acquisition system is super old. It's the one you see here. It's actually a specially made PC uh, with a lot of special hardware inside. There is uh, the, uh, the power supply you can see here. Uh, this whole thing actually still works, um, but due to the very old nature of the data acquisition system, we don't have all the features that we want. And it's just a matter of time, I think, before this thing uh, shuts down. It's still actually running from a floppy disk. It doesn't even have a hard drive, so it's a kind of a miracle that it still runs. So we're going to upgrade it today with the latest version of the Your Dino data acquisition system. So the first thing to check is whether we can reuse the power supply. So that's uh, that's a good chance of that since it's actually working. This is the power supply for this unit. It's very similar in the construction to that Semicron version that I've uh, explained online. And we looked at it a little bit and found out that it's controlled by an analog signal, a 0 to 10 volt analog signal. It comes in just down here. Uh, your dyno can output a 0 to 5 volt analog signal, so you need a little bit of an uh, interface board that I, I created. I'll show you how it looks. Here we see the interface board. It's a small little thing. It's just an op-amp, and then you have a, a 12 volt input, power supply input. You have the 0 to 5 volt that comes from your dyno, and then it's the 10, 0 to 10 volt output here. So, uh, very simple. You can build it on your own back in your in your uh, in, in your office or your your garage the next thing to check is whether we can reuse the load cell in in most cases you should be able to reuse the load cell here is the connector to the load cell and as you see it has more pins than your dyno needs your dyno needs four pins plus a shield and here you see there are more than that so uh, we can take a look at the documentation to see how it is connected here we see the documentation for the load cell connection. As you can see, they have two uh, wires going to the plus and minus. And the reason for that is to um, compensate for a small loss that you will have, a voltage loss that you will have in the, in the cable going to the bridge that's providing some current. This is not necessary for us because we are calibrating it away in any case. So we can put the two connections together. Here we see the two plus wires here and the two minus wires here. We can put them together. And here we see the signal cable. So we, now we know how to connect it to your dyno. The next thing to check is whether we can reuse the sensor for the RPM. In this case, we couldn't. It has an inductive sensor, which doesn't work uh, for, um, for us. We need a Hall effect sensor. And as you can see, we have put the sensor to, to the Yordino sensor here. And we have also machined a new uh, trigger wheel. You can see it beside the original one. The reason why we want a new wheel is to have a little bit larger spacing between the teeth. There is the spec online, you can see what the, the spacing needs to be. This trigger wheel here, the original one, has two small spacing. And since we want to be able to run with the old system, just to compare, we made just another wheel and put it side by side with the other one. Okay, we are ready to go. Ready for some work, all right. All right, so it wasn't that easy to find out which pin was which on the load cell. So we connected it up like this and now we can measure it. So first is to find where is power and it's actually two places. It's one power uh, pair here and another power pair here. And the signal, we can measure it here. Now you see there is a very small, uh, uh, this is a millivolt, so there's a little bit of, of a signal here. And if you step on the load cell now, here you see it increases. All right, so now we know for sure what is what. We have here brown and white is the, is the signal. And then there are two power pairs that we will just connect together. All right, let's move on. All right, we have connected everything up and load cell is working. As you can see here, it reads, of course, something completely wrong because it's not um, calibrated yet. Um, but you can see from the raw uh, reading that it's quite stable and when you step on the load cell it starts increasing. So we are ready to calibrate. 
So we have prepared the calibration by finding a suitable weight. This is about 90 kilos, so that should be good. And we have a bracket, this bracket here, that we're gonna place on top of the load cell here. So let's do the calibration. The first step is to do a zero calibration, then we're gonna just press the button when we have no load on the load cell, like now. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. All right, we're ready for calibration. We do a zero calibrate, and now we're gonna put the load on top of the load cell. All right. Don't worry what it's going to read here. It will be completely random since it's not calibrated anymore when we do a load calibrate. And you can see see now it shows 98.3 something like that kilos. All right, we are ready for testing. Here is our short car hooked up to the dyno. And we have a uh, a nice little screen here and a, a USB extension cable to the your dyno box which is, sits over here. So this is the small little box that does the same thing as this whole, this whole box here. Yeah, here's the brake. Here we see the result of the previous run. And there are a few things to explain uh, here and I'll go through them. First, there is this kind of a weird pattern here in the beginning. And what actually happened here was the throttle was not at 100% when we started collecting data. So you see the, it's a very low reading here. The guy stepped on the throttle, the brake started braking and it was a little bit of a back and forth before it became stable. You can actually look at that in the results versus time. If we turn on RPM, you see here the RPM went up and now a little bit like this. Okay, so this is how it looks then when you do an, uh, uh, the RPM, uh, the results versus RPM. Of course, you can just delete this part of the data or you can start uh, recording at full throttle or, uh, or things like that, easy to get rid of. The next thing to uh, explain is this step that we see here. So what we have in solid lines are the torque and horsepower uh, at the engine, while the dashed line are torque and horsepower at the wheel. Uh, so the the way we find the engine uh, horsepower and torque is to take the wheel horsepower and torque and add the drivetrain loss. And the drivetrain loss is calculated during retardation. You see that here. So all the way down here, uh, we record the time it takes to decelerate the rollers and since we know the uh, moment of inertia of the of the rollers we can then calculate the torque it takes to to slow them down uh, as fast as as we we uh, can see that, that it does so this uh, then uh, this loss is then added to the wheel uh, hp and wheel torque and then you get the engine 
uh, horsepower and engine torque. Uh, and what happened was that we didn't bother to uh, wait uh, longer than down to 7500 RPM roughly. So above there we can calculate uh, the, the loss uh, while below we cannot. So we will see uh, the, uh, the, um, the engine and uh, engine uh, HP and engine torque will be at the same as the wheel uh, HP and wheel torque below this, this point. Okay, of course, if you if you just wait long enough, you will uh, you will have the the correction all the way down. All right. So the next point to look at is this little effect here that looks a bit weird. It does not look real, and actually you can see that it comes from the retardation data. So what happens here is that um, the engine goes into its uh, uh, RPM limit here at uh, thirteen thousand eight hundred, and then the clutch is depressed and there is probably here a small throttle blip. This engine has a wet clutch and if you do a throttle blip there is much less uh, loss. There is less loss than if you have, a, um, if you have the engine on, on idle. So there is a small little effect of that. This is probably what happened. We saw a few of the... Uh, this happened in a few of the runs. So we need to be very careful. Just press the, press the clutch and nothing else. You see a little bit of the same thing here, much lower though, but a little bit of, uh, of noise just here, and it translates this into noise in the, in the calculated engine um, uh, torque and HP, right? So it's important to, to keep the engine at idle at all times. What's interesting to see as well here is that there is quite some loss at high RPMs. You can see here from here, or maybe from from here to here and here to here, there is much bigger loss than, than down down here. And uh, there is of course more drag at high RPMs. The the wet clutch has quite some drag uh, since it's bathed in oil, and all the gears and everything uh, is drawing more power at high RPM than than low RPM. So here we are calculating it, you know, versus the RPM. It's of course a much better way to, to do it than to have this fixed, a fixed uh, correction. I will go, go through a few of the applicable options for this setup. So we can start by looking at the brake controller, for example. As you recall, this brake uh, uh, is controlled by an analog signal, sign, uh, 0 to 10 volts. So we output uh, an analog signal 0 to 5 volts, that's all we can do, that's the maximum. And then we have this small interface board that uh, makes us 0 to 10 volts. In some cases you may want to choose PWM if that's what your controller needs. But in this case it was an analog output. We can take a look at the horsepower correction as well. And as I mentioned we have uh, a frictional losses that we are calculating from the retardation data. The alternative to this would be a static correction, 15% for example, or whatever you choose. But it's better to use uh, the, the calculation to calculate the frictional losses from the retardation data. This is not always possible. You need heavy rollers so that it takes a while for the deceleration to occur so that you can have a, an accurate measurement during the retardation. Obviously this will work for an inertia dyno. But for a brake dyno, uh, you will not always have enough moment of inertia in your system for this to work. Um, another point is that the brake needs to be completely off, so no drag in the brake when it is off. right? So this will work fine for eddy current brakes, but it, it will not work for, say, a water brake or a hydraulic brake. So, but if you have a, a, a brake that is completely off when it is off, so no drag, and you have heavy enough rollers, then you can enable this uh, 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 calculated frictional losses uh, option. And uh, you set up the moment of inertia here in the basic dyno setup. Here, uh, here you have about um, uh, 10, uh, mo the moment of inertia is about 10 for this uh, specific setup. Uh, so you enter it here. There is actually a way uh, with your dyno to find out what this uh, moment of inertia is. 
you can try to calculate it. That's quite an uh, an exercise. Um, there are calculators online, but even with that, there is it's it's quite a lot of work to come up with an accurate number. So it's nice that we are able to measure it uh, using some uh, trick in your Dino, and I'll make a video about it a little bit later. You see also here that you can click on this option to compensate for inertia effects during acceleration. So for brake dynos uh, the, uh, that goes through an accelerated run, like we did here now in this, this previous run, uh, it will, it, to get the right um, reading, you, can, you need to compensate for the acceleration. When your rollers are heavy in particular, then it will take quite some, uh, some power from the engine for just to accelerate them. So the total power comes from measuring the, the load cell and from taking into account the inertia effect. Of course, for a steady state test, it does not matter whether we uh, compensate for inertia effect because the, the, the RPM is steady, obviously. But for, um, for a ramp like we just did, you need to enable this one. Okay, those are the most important uh, settings uh, in this uh, in this setup. I can briefly mention the horse that the noise filtering as well. We enable the IAR filter. I recommend to always leave this on. It's a nice digital filter that removes noise but doesn't really affect the curve much. So you should leave this on. And then, if you need, you would add a little bit of smoothing in addition if you uh, to, to make a, a nice curve. If you start by turning this off and increasing the smoothing, you will also get a smooth curve, but it will be a bit dull because there is a lot of averaging here. So it's better to start with uh, the digital filter on and then add smoothing later. Okay, so hang tight for a few more videos that will be coming uh, in the next few weeks.